Good afternoon and welcome to this Tom Lantos Rights Commission, Human Rights Commission hearing on the state of judicial independence in Central, in Central America. I extend a special welcome to our witnesses, who I will introduce shortly, and to Co-Chair Smith. Uh, Congresswoman Norma Torres, a member of the Executive Committee uh, of the Human Rights Commission, will be joining us soon, and I look forward to her participation and, uh, and to anybody else who comes on. I'll recognize them. Uh, one housekeeping note, uh, this hearing uh, we want to have is, has a hard stop at 2 p.m. today. I ask my colleagues and the witnesses to uh, to keep that in mind and uh, try to keep their remarks to five minutes in keeping with the usual house practice so we can make sure we have plenty of time for questions and answers. The issue we will examine today is not new. The United States has sought to strengthen Central American judiciaries since the 1980s. Between fiscal years 2010 and 2020, U.S. government agencies obligated more than $634 million to support legal and judicial development and anti-corruption organizations and institutions in Central America. Most of the funds were allocated to the three countries of the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. The U.S. did this because we have known for a long time that the judicial systems in the region work mostly to protect the interests of the powerful elites while serving as instruments of repression against the majority of citizens. We did this because we understand that strong judicial systems with truly independent investigators and prosecutors are essential for fair and just governance. The role they play in protecting human rights is irreplaceable. Some progress was made. For example, between fiscal years 2017 and 2019, USA, USAID reported that the number of convictions by U.S. supported prosecutors increased threefold in El Salvador and Guatemala and tenfold in Honduras. But as we will hear today, what we're seeing now is dramatic backsliding. The international anti corruption institutions, CISIG and MOXI, that inspired so much hope for thousands of people in Guatemala and Honduras, have been dismantled. In El Salvador, CCS is on its way to the same fate. Brilliant, committed judges and prosecutors, often women, are subjected to unending, baseless legal complaints and have been forced to flee their countries. I'm thinking of Claudia Pazipas, Paz, who is a witness today. I'm thinking of Claudia Escobar, Thelma Aldana, Douglas Melendez, and most recently, Gloria Porras. Constitutional courts are being remade to cater to the whims of authoritarian leaders looking to eliminate any semblance of democracy. And I'm not just talking about Nicaragua. Guatemala's slow motion stacking of its constitutional court is essentially no different from El Salvador's mass dismissal of constitutional court magistrates. And civil society leaders whose commitment to human rights and democracy is such an important driver for positive change are also facing increasing threats and attacks. Some, like Berta Caceres, have been murdered. The trial of David Castillo for Berta's murder is taking place as we speak, right now. And it is a crucial test, and is a crucial test case of whether any judicial independence remains in Honduras. Others, like Helen Mack in Guatemala, are being inundated with trumped up legal charges and a thinly disguised effort to uh, de uh, delegitimize her. So let me be clear. We see through this stuff. We know these human rights organizations. We, we know these human rights organizations. We know these civil society leaders. We know the investigators. We know the prosecutors. We know the judges. We know the ombudsman. They are not the, the Central Americans being investigated in New York and Miami for drug trafficking and being sanctioned for corruption and human rights violations. They are not the ones lining their own pockets at the expense of the people they're supposed to be governing. So I'm glad that the Biden administration is talking about human rights as a centerpiece of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, we will see what that means um, as their policies become uh, clearer. I welcome the creation of the new anti-corruption task force for Guatemala and expect it means the end of efforts to dismantle uh, uh, FACE and, and as well as dismantling the high-risk courts. I support USAID's decision, decision to take funds away from the Salvadoran institutions 
that Mr. Bukele just gutted and redirect them to civil society instead. But I think we all can agree that these steps are barely a start. We need an entirely, we need, and I mean this, we need an entirely new strategy toward the region that truly prioritizes human rights and rule of law as indispensable conditions for ending poverty, hunger, and hopelessness. That is the only way we will bring an end over time to forced migration. Restoring judicial independence is a key pillar for that new strategy. The organizations we will hear from today bring recommendations on how to accomplish that, and I look forward to hearing the, uh, from them. We will also include uh, in the record guidance from the Inter-American Human Rights System and additional recommendations from the Due Process of Law Foundation. Uh, again, I, uh, I welcome uh, all of our witnesses. Um, thank you so much for being here. This is an important topic um, and one that we need to take very, very seriously. And I'm now uh, happy to turn to Co-Chair Smith for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, Co-Chair. Uh, the topic of today's hearing is one which should garner support on both sides of the aisle. The importance of judicial independence indeed is a matter of general principle embedded among larger principles, namely respect for constitutionalism and the separation of power, support is widespread. So too, so too for related principles such as fighting corruption and promoting the rule of law. As one of our witnesses, Eric Olson said, fighting corruption and promoting the rule of law is not a left-wing or right-wing agenda. Problem of course is when the principle is distorted to fit an ideological agenda, when for example, so-called anti-corruption campaigns are applied not in an even-handed manner, but rather as a partisan and ideological tool against one side to advance the interests of the other. The countries of Central America are varied, as we all know, and each is faced with unique problems. Some concerns remain constant, however, such as endemic corruption, social and economic inequality, and ideological polarization. The status of an independent judiciary, likewise, varies from country to country, though there are some troubling trends in the region. In El, in El Salvador, the president has appeared to be moved in a high-handed manner, removing and replacing judges from the constitutional chamber with the support of the National Assembly, where he holds a supermajority. The question with respect to El Salvador, which I would like to hear answered by our panelists, is whether he did so in defiance of the Constitution. In Nicaragua, we see a judiciary which has become an appendage of the authoritarian, authoritarian Ortega regime, too often rubber stamping prosecutorial abuses. Indeed, just yesterday, Nicaragua opposition leader Felix Maradiega was arrested and beaten with his family and supporters questioning where he is being detained. The judicial system has become politicized with judges and magistrates beholding to their Ortega's Sandinista's National Liberation Front. <clears throat> Pardon me. Jared Genser, an international human rights lawyer with special expertise in arbitrary detention, has worked on more than 50 political prisoner cases over his career and is the author of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Submitted testimony that is hearing and said, and I quote in part, just yesterday, my pro bono client, Felix Maridiega, a prominent Nicaraguan activist and presidential candidate, was beaten, detained, and disappeared by Nicaraguan security forces. In recent weeks, Ortega uh, has transparently and brazenly decapitated and politicized the opposition by disqualifying all of the leading candidates most likely to prevail in the opposition's presidential primary vote on August uh, 2nd, 2021, including Christiana Chamorro, Arturo Cruz, and Felix. He goes on to say in Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega has completely co-opted the justice system to serve his own interests, and consolidate his autocratic rule in the country. Currently, there are more than 120 political prisoners in the country detained on pretextual charges. Judges in Nicaragua often try to provide these detentions with the patina of legitimacy by going through the motions to make what are clearly political show trials appear real, but few are fooled. He goes on and completes uh, his testimony. Ortega has shamelessly exploited Nicaragua's judicial system to eliminate systematically any challenges to his authority. The international community must unequivocally condemn this assault on Nicaragua's democracy and must work urgently to restore and fortify judicial independence and the rule of law in Nicaragua and Central America. 
It is perhaps Guatemala, however, that has received the most attention of late, given the recent visit by Vice President uh, Kamala Harris uh, to the country. My colleague and co-chair Jim McGovern and I agree on a lot of things. We have stood shoulder to shoulder on combating the depredations of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, for example, which I greatly appreciate. And I think we would both agree that the independence of the judiciary under, is under serious attack in Guatemala. Where I think we disagree, however, is where the attack against the independence of Guatemala's judiciary is coming from. I believe an honest examination of the record would reveal that it has come in part from the United States, including under two former ambassadors. Todd Robinson in particular, who has aligned himself with uh, left-wing political actors in the country and abroad, has also come from an activist out of control UN agency, CSIG, funded in part by the United States, which was the subject of a Helsinki Commission hearing, which I chaired, that examined the role played by CSIG and Russian state actors, principally VTB Bank, sanctioned by the US Treasury Department, in intervening in Guatemala's legal system and persecuting a Russian family, the Bitkovs, who have fled the long arm of Vladimir Putin. Human rights champion Bill Browder, the man who tenaciously and brilliantly led the campaign for the enactment of the Magnitsky Act and Global Magnitsky, after the government of Russia arrested, tortured, and killed his lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, in November of 2009, has championed the Bitkovs case. Mr. Browder testified at my April 27th hearing uh, in 2018 on their behalf and said, in part, inexplicably, VTB Bank gained the legal status as an interested party in the migration case against the Bitkovs with the support of CSIG. In January 2015, a criminal case against the Bitkovs was opened at the direction of CSIG, says Bill Browder. Immediately after that, he testified that, quote, 70 armed police officers raided the Bitkovs' home, arrested Arena, Igor, and Anastasia, and detained them in cages behind the parking garage in the main court building in Guatemala City. The Bitkov should have been granted asylum, not prison. An earlier appeals court ruling ruled that the Bitkov's uh, offense was perhaps only administrative in nature and punishable with a fine, yet Igor was sentenced to 19 years in prison, and Irina and Anastasia was, were sentenced to 14 years each. We will hear from one of the Bitkov's arena as a witness uh, today. Indeed, this strange alliance between Cixing and the Russian actors and the role played by key left-wing political figures such as attorney Alfonso Carrillo in mediating this alliance met with what I can best describe as incuriosity by former Ambassador Robinson, who has been nominated by President Biden to serve as the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at State. I hope that my Senate colleagues inquire at confirmation as to the reasons for this incuriosity, if that's what it was, by Ambassador Robinson with respect to Russia's role with CSIG and also a Russian influence on Guatemala's constitutional court, whose composition was heavily influenced by Mr. Robinson. In that regard, I commend a column from the always excellent Mary Anastasia O'Grady, published this week in the Wall Street Journal, where she states, and I quote, Mr. Robinson's record raises serious questions about his suitability for the job as head of INL. As she points out, as ambassador, Mr. Robinson, quote, earned a reputation for meddling in domestic politics in ways that went well beyond the scope of his responsibility. He was, was known, for example, for pressuring Guatemala's Congress to confirm judges aligned with his political views. I ask that Ms. O'Grady's article, as well as a series of articles, again, I'll be entered into the record and commend them to my Senate colleagues as they consider Ambassador Robinson's nomination. I also commend an excellent statement of the record submitted by Stephen Hecht on impunity of uh, impunity observer, which elaborates on Todd Robinson's intervention with respect to the composition of Guatemala's constitutional court in particular with regards to the appointment of former Justice Gloria Porras. And here I must remind this panel that the principle of independence of the judiciary resides within the context of larger principles, namely the importance of constitutionalism and respect for the separation of powers. One cannot, in the name of safeguarding the independence of the judiciary, allow a handful of judges to run roughshod over their constitution and violate 
the separation of powers. Yet as amply demonstrated by, by Mr. Hecht, uh, what the Constitutional Court did under Gloria Porras, where he describes as twice participated in a ruling that stopped Congress from processing cases against her. It is worth noting that prior to her visit to Guatemala, Vice President Harris met quite publicly with both Gloria Porras and Thelma Aldana, uh, the former Attorney General of Guatemala in the United States. Indeed, the reason that meeting was held in the United States and not Guatemala might be because Thelma uh, had two outstanding arrest warrants in Guatemala on charges of corruption. This is another area of inquiry for the Senate with respect to Ambassador Robinson. When it appears for, when he appears for confirmation, what was his role in protecting and promoting Thelma Aldana? At our Helsinki hearing, we received testimony that a former Guatemalan uh, official named Myra Veliz was at the heart of a passport and fraudulent document ring. There was incredible allegations of army corruption of RENAP, R-E-N-A-P. Yet instead of investigating her, Thelma uh, Aldana gave Velez a position in the Attorney General's office and protected her. Indeed, we saw the prosecution of low-ranking functionaries by Aldana and CSIG and the disproportionate harassment of the Bitkovs who received documents after entrusting the Cutino law firm, another politically connected actor was, uh, was someone who somehow escaped the scrutiny of Aldana. Thus, I think another line of inquiry for Ambassador Robinson would be the extent of his awareness of Thelma Aldana's role in failing to investigate those officials, such as Myra Veliz, allegedly involved in the distribution of fraudulent documents to foreign nationals. And what were the national security implications to the United States of this apparent, apparent incuriosity? To make a final point, and what alarms me, and I believe colleagues such as Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Roger Wicker, who have criticized the intervention of actors such as CSIG and Russia in the workings of the Guatemalan judicial system are the double standards. Of course, we are against corruption and efforts to undermine the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. But what is so infuriating is that these important principles are so often applied in a one-sided manner and used to advance the interests of the political left. If we are going to fight corruption and defend the rule of law in countries such as Guatemala, it is important that we do so in an even-handed and fair manner, tackling wrongdoing by both political right and political left with consistency, predictability, and commitment. I thank you, and I yield back uh, to my good friend and colleague. Yeah. Well, th I thank the gentleman for his comments, and I think he stated it accurately in the beginning that, uh, that there's much that we agree on um, when we talk about human rights and uh, and uh, rule of law and how we deal with some of these issues and there's some stuff that we, we, we disagree on um, and um, and I would um, uh, I would just say that um, you know uh, again this is a, a, a serious uh, uh, issue that we need to deal with because I do think that there is we see the a major backsliding um, in terms of democracy happening right now uh, in countries, and, he, and the gentleman mentioned at the beginning about what's happening in Nicaragua. I should just say, for the record, um, you know that uh, that one of the um, uh, opposition leaders that uh, Daniel Ortega has just arrested is a guy named Arturo Cruz Jr., who is a friend of mine and I've known for many, many years. He and I are different politically. I mean, where we don't agree on on everything, uh, but uh, I am I I, I worry about um, his safety and. Uh, and I think that um, it is really a sad state of affairs that um, that multiple opposition leaders are now um, are now uh, either under house arrest or be, are in prison. And I think that is a, that is a, a very dangerous thing. And so, um, anyway, let me go through our witnesses. Dr. Jose Luis Gonzalez Duban, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I uh, appreciate a lot the opportunity to talk uh, this morning in this hearing. Uh, before I make my statement, I would like to say that uh, Guatemala is very different from El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Uh, Guatemala's judicial system has been severely damaged during the last five years. Its court of last resort, the Constitutional Court, has cast aside the Constitution and has ruled arbitrarily causing great damage to our country and yours. 
Compounding this damage was the creation of the FESI, the special branch of the public prosecutor's office against corruption and impunity. The head of the FESI, Prosecutor Juan Francisco Sandoval, coordinated closely with the previous CC and likewise put politics above the law. He has multiple criminal charges against him, including by the state attorney. They are suppressed apparently because of US influence. I have never been involved in politics, nor have I held public office. I'm an attorney, professor of law, and media commentator. It is not my intention to be political here, but unfortunately I cannot refrain from mentioning some prom prominent US officials who have played a major role in Guatemala if I am to be accurate in talking about judicial independence in Guatemala. I assume all of you care about the rule of law. If any of you have supported people in my country who violate the law in positions of authority, I would attribute such support to not knowing our laws and the facts of what happens in Guatemala. I am more than happy to answer your questions today and in the future, if you believe I can help you better understand our legal realities. The Obama administration illegally took over the public prosecutor's office in 2010. When they lost control of it in 2014, Joe Biden took charge, regained control over criminal prosecution in 2015 and added control of the CC in 2016. They achieved this sad result by coercion and threats, canceling US visas, placing their targets on a blacklist and criminal investigations conducted by the CC. Former ambassador Todd Robinson executed this strategy to place magistrates on our courts who would do his bidding regardless of law. As its major donor and political supporter, the CC always acted in concert with the embassy. Your diplomats and politicians always talk about an independent judiciary and transparency. If they are sincere, they should look at the public record it is painful to listen to people praise as corruption fighters those who so obviously violate the law. It leads one to ask if such persons have an agenda to extinguish the constitutional system. Five different entities each appoint a principal and ultimate magistrate to the constitutional court. This year, unlike 2016 with Robinson in charge, our authorities resisted US Embassy and White House intimidation and threats and appointed independent magistrates for the first time in five years. The previous constitutional court from 2016 through 2021 illegally closed mining and hydroelectric companies which provoked thousands of workers to immigrate illegally to into the United States in search of work. The judiciary protected violent NGOs that steal electricity, invade private property while armed, forced campesinos to attack mining and hydroelectric installation, block roads, and pay people to go to cities to smash business, monuments, and public and private buildings. Groups such as Codeca, Conic, Cook, and others like them are the equivalent of Black Lives Matter and Antifa in Guatemala. Their methods of destruction and intimidation are similar. The US Embassy has controlled FESI since its beginning. It has persecuted the left political enemies, which continues today. For this reason, the White House, State Department, and some in Congress and the media have made a great effort to give Sandoval a false profile. They invent prices for a false heroism and call Sandoval a fighter against corruption, offering him unconditional public support. Finally, Guatemala has begun to move toward the rule of law 
with truly independent judges. Some Democrats, the State Department affirmed the opposite. For them, judicial independence is to have a system they control as they did under Biden when he was vice president. This is a time to stop supporting criminality in our system. If you want to help us create rule of law, at least don't oppose us and impose a criminal system on us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Irina, Irina Bikova. I'm here. It is a great honor to have your attention and our family is very grateful for this. I will go straight to the core of the problem. As you might know, our family has been politically persecuted by Kremlin for over a decade now. We still find ourselves in a perilous situation. In the, in the 1990s, Igor and I, well, we founded a successful pulp and paper company in Russia called Northwest Timber Company. It was valued at nearly half a billion dollars. One of the Putin's bankers, Shaz, asked to sell 51% of the business for $25 million. We refused. I was asked to become a representative of Putin's political party in Moscow. I refused. Consequently, our daughter, when seven, a 16 year old, was kidnapped and raped for three years on the orders of Kremlin. And this traumatic event provoked a number of grave illnesses in Anastasia. Up to this day, she needs constant treatment and medicine. Our story has many similarities to that of Bill Browder. First, Russian officials steal everything from us when they accuse us of theft. And uh, we came to Guatemala to escape persecution, but the Kremlin caught up with us and used its influence to encourage Guatemalan prosecutors, judges, and even magistrates to fabricate a case against our family. We had a local law firm, Putino International, that offered citizenship services and governmental protection. They told us the process was completely legal. Thousands of foreign citizens acquired Guatemalan passports in this way. But we were the only ones to face criminal prosecution. We will consider it part of a criminal group issuing passport and tried with a group of low level officials. My husband received a 90 year jail sentence for passport violation. My daughter and I, 14 years each. The people who authorized and signed our documents, including the former minister of Foreign Affairs and Vice President of Migration Office, Myra Bellis, were never investigated. Russian officials have been involved in our case since 2013, when the now sanctioned Russian state bank, VTB, presented a complaint against our family. The complaint did not proceed of the lack of evidence. However, uh, until CSIC got involved. In 2014, the president of VTB Bank, Andrei Kostin, signed a power of attorney to Henry Conte, who is a magistrate of Constitutional Court of Guatemala, while the president of another sanctioned entity Gazprom Bank Andrei Akimov signed a power of attorney to Guatemalan lawyer Alfonso Carrillo, who is a close friend of the head of CC, 
Ivan Velasquez. On 3rd of November 2014, Ivan Velasquez personally asked Attorney General Telma Aldana to merge the complaint of VTB Bank with a human trafficking case known as the immigration case, as well to assign the case to a particular prosecutor of FESI, Stuart Campo. Right afterward, our family was arrested and imprisoned while our three-year-old son was sent to an orphanage. My daughter and where, where and when our son was abused physically and psychologically. My daughter and I spent a year and a half in preventive prison and my husband three and a half years. Meanwhile, the fabricated case against us proceeded. There was a complete lack of evidence, but that did not matter to the prosecutors or judges. At the request of CSIC, VTB Bank was named as co-plaintiff in the immigration case against us. The formal accusation was that there were anomalies in the official documents issued to us by the Guatemalan government. In February 2015, the Russian Ministry of Interior Affairs sent a request for mutual legal assistance on our case to Guatemalan authorities. Guatemala and Russia do not have an agreement of mutual legal assistance. Nevertheless, the Guatemalan authorities cooperated. On 5th of October, three months before the trial began, Judge Erika Aifan sent a letter to Russian embassy indicating the jail sentences that we will receive. Constitutional Court and Court of Appeals issued us constitutional protection twice, stating that no crime was committed. Yet, they still permitted the judges to sentence us. This abuse were committed under the former president of the Constitutional Court, Gloria Porras. During the imprisonment, my husband was tortured by judge, judges Erika Aifan and Jasmine Barrios, who later were found guilty of torture by the National Commission of Prevention of Torture. We presented an appeal of prejudice to the Supreme Court of Justice against these two judges. However, it was declined on the grounds that the appeal was presented out of vengeance. Meanwhile, in Russia, VTB Bank made numerous statements recognizing the role of CSIC in imprisoning our family. While state channel, channels called our imprisonment a victory of Russian intelligence services. In prison, my daughter and I were asked to testify against my husband, Igor. The questions were sent by the public ministry on behalf of the Russian attorney general. Right now, we are all the under how we, right now we are all under house arrest and can be sent back to prison to any moment. The Court of Appeals last year confirmed the absurd sentences of 40 years for me and my daughter. My husband was notified yesterday after uh, a retrial that Court of Appeals not only confirmed his sentences, but augmented it, adding two years of prison more, as was asked by the public ministry. The miscarriage of justice by the Guatemalan judicial body was committed not only in our case, but in many others as well. The most outrageous ones are Odebrecht, Sigma, and Bantrap case. Odebrecht and Sigma, with help of Guatemalan officials, stole $650 million from Guatemalan budget. Bandrap is about laundering of Nicolas Maduro regime 
money from Guatemalan bank bankrupt Cecit covered up covered it up by imprisoning scapegoats while protected the real criminals. I can offer additional information later if necessary. Honorable members of the Lantas Human Rights Commission, I ask you to please look into these unthinkable abuses committed openly by the Guatemalan judicial system. We are in legal limbo. We are under house arrest and have no documents and no ability to work and earn a living. It is incomprehensible to me how Guatemalan and Russian officials would want to torture my children. I cannot describe to you what we have been through. Our nightmare is still not over. We are only alive thanks to the intervention of Bill Browder, who took a personal interest in our case and brought, brought it to the Helsinki Commission and to the US Congress. We have learned that as enemies of the Russian state, we cannot possibly assert our rights in Guatemala. Thank you um, very much. And if you permit me. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Are you finished? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thank all the witnesses uh, for testifying. Again, I, 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 we, I, we need to get this, we need to kind of try to wrap up as close to two, or a little bit after two as possible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna first yield my time to uh, Ms. Torres of California, then to Mr. Smith, then to Ms. Jackson Lee, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close. But before I do, I just wanna just say something for the record. We, we've heard some names tossed around U.S. officials uh, who have been cr publicly criticized uh, here today. Uh, especially with regard to sanctioning of certain Guatemalan um, Guatemalans, uh, uh, and I, I, I guess through the through the Global Magnitsky Act, and I I just want to point out for the record, it's hard to get on that list, um, and there are people who I would like on that list that because of the review process I can't get on that list. Same for Mr. Smith, uh, and same for the president, by the way. So just because somebody says, I want X person on that list, doesn't mean they get on that list. There is a whole interagency review process, including the Treasury Department, the State Department, and others. So it is a long process. And with regard to the two Guatemalans that were mentioned uh, earlier, I mean, they're not only on the, on the US Global Magnitsky list, the UK has sanctioned them as well. So I, I just point that out because I, I think we need to be very careful with how we characterize, um, you know, uh, those who have been called out for cor for corruption, um, you know, especially with regard to trying to influence uh, this uh, ju judiciary selection. So, um, you know, if you're on the global, if you're on the Magnitsky list in Russia or the global Magnitsky list in any other country, it, it takes a lot of work to get on that list. Um, it can't just be an accusation. It just, I mean, you ha there has to be a lot of stuff to convince all these departments that you are deserving for that. And I just point that out uh, because I don't want to diminish the efforts to go into uh, getting people on that list, um, not only under the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now currently under the Biden administration. So now I, I would yield to Ms. Torres uh, for any questions. Again, if we can keep it succinct so we, we, we can get out of here by two, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, bringing us together today to highlight these very important uh, issues um, and the issue of judicial independence in Central America. Uh, this issue is critical now and independent institutions and investigations should not be evaluated in a vacuum on, on hearsay. Um, they are a critical, critical to a functioning and healthy democracy. Co-opting and controlling the courts only helps to protect those in power and their personal interest. 
these attacks that we are seeing and the increasing erosion of independent judicial systems are a reflection of you know, the growing problem of authoritarianism in the region. In undemocratic countries across the world, the biggest threat to elites are independent and effective voices that speak truth to power and challenge the status quo. Not surprisingly, in the Northern Triangle, we are seeing the governments and their henchmen increasingly target the very few remaining independent institutions and in civil society. In Guatemala, the lead of special prosecutor against immunity, Juan Francisco Sandoval, uh, Judge Erica Ifan, um, and States International Woman of the Year recipient, by the way, um, and the Human Rights Ombudsman, Jordan Roda, Rodas, uh, endure a constant barrage of slander and retaliatory attacks for challenging the status quo. Um, we've heard some of that here. Uh, this war comes at a great risk to those brave champions of the rule of law. Many who have made real progress on this, including Ms. Uh, Pasi Paz, she had to leave the country after threats and, uh, and, and attempted legal retaliation. We must immediately and effectively support these actors for their safety and allow them to carry out their mandates. So my first question is, in repressive environments like these, how can we help ensure the safety of judicial figures, investigators, and activists, while also enabling these workers to continue to work within the country? Um, and can you also speak to the elimination of checks and balances and how that impacts rule of law in the region? And how can civil society in the Northern Triangle fill the void in critical efforts like the fight against corruption and upholding a uh, rule of law without the government's um, support? Um, if we can um, start uh, with Claudia um, Pasipas. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Claudia. Dear Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for their testimony. I'd like to, uh, Irina uh, Bikova, your statement was very powerful. Um, we ought to, all of us, be calling for justice for the Bitcoffs. And I find it appalling that there are too many people who look askance, uh, too many people who think that, um, you know, what you have been through, which is one of the gross miscarriages of justice I have ever seen. You know, I work on political prisoners for 41 years. And I can tell you, uh, your case is right at the top when the bank and the kleptocracy of Vladimir Putin follows you, first steals your, your assets, your bank, I mean, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your company, then follows you, your daughter is, is raped, then follows you as you go to Latvia, then you went to Turkey, and then thought you had found a safe haven in Guatemala, only to be tracked down five years later uh, by the Russians. They have very good intelligence. And it, it, it's beguiling to me as to why CSIG wanted to become a partner with Putin. That question has never been answered. Why did they merge your case with a human trafficking case? I wrote our law on human trafficking called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. I take a backseat to no one in combating sex and labor trafficking. It's one of the most horrible offenses on the face of the earth, modern day slavery. To take a case where you got documents to protect yourself, almost like a witness protection uh, mode so that they wouldn't find you in order to get into Guatemala. You knew that they didn't have an extradition uh, agreement with the Russians, so you knew it was a safer place than you thought to be. And then, as you pointed out in your testimony on November 3rd, uh, 2014, Ivan Velasquez personally asked the general prosecutor, Thelma Adelana, to merge the complaint in the VTB bank with a human trafficking case known as the migration case and to assign a particular prosecutor. Right after that, you point out your husband, daughter, and you uh, were arrested and imprisoned while your three-year-old son was sent to an orphanage. That is an outrage. And we all should be calling for justice for the Bitcoffs and doing it aggressively. I was surprised some people who followed your testimony never even referenced back to it. You are, you are persecuted by the long arm of the Russian um, uh, government 
Vladimir Putin and his banks. As, as Bill Browder pointed out, Gazprom Bank got involved as well as did other Russian banks because they wanted to send a message to anyone if they don't agree to just forfeiting their assets to this kleptocracy, they'll follow you anywhere you go, anywhere in the world. So you're being made an example of by the Putin uh, dictatorship. And I would hope that more members would be calling for your, we've never gotten a, an accounting from uh, CSIG on this. I would love to have them come and testify. I have 30 questions I'd like to ask them uh, in order to get to the record and get this straightened out. And you are owed a very, very serious apology uh, by this whole process, by the enablers, wittingly or unwittingly, who look askance towards your case. When I held that hearing back in April of 2018, there were people who were trying to stop that hearing. Bill Browder, you pointed out, has been a champion for your case, as he was in after he was killed for Sergei Magnitsky uh, in terms of bringing to light uh, the dishonor of the Russian government and now by, by working with them and partnering with them, uh, the Guatemalans as well as CSIG. So I, Mr. Chairman, let's invite um, Velasquez to come and, and, and testify. I wanna ask some real questions of him uh, and I'll do it too, I, I'll call the hearing. Secondly, I just wanna say about judiciaries very briefly and Ronnie, you might wanna just say a brief word, but you know, all judiciaries have some level of politicization, our own does. I mean, even now there's very serious talk about packing our court because that's all about what are the outcomes when it comes to policy decisions. Uh, if there is corruption, uh, thankfully we have a very vigorous justice department that hopefully would go after that. But you know, in many cases, courts have become uh, super legislatures, having the last word on legislation. Uh, so the packing of the court, uh, and we know in every presidential election, uh, the issue of who goes on the courts in the United States is always a huge issue, especially for the United States uh, Supreme Court. So uh, I just want to, you know, we've got to be very, but again, countenancing no corruption uh, and, and the rules need to be followed. So we need to continue to rededicate ourselves uh, to that. So um, I, I read if you just want to have the, the last word on this, I would like to yield to you. But again, I thank you for your courage and what you and your husband and family have been through. Remember, and I think most members may not know this, but they are on a, on a tear, frankly, to take your son who was born in Guatemala and send him back to Russia, to an orphanage there. Uh, thankfully, your lawyers and you and your husband were able to, to stop that. Um, and getting him back, had they uh, deported him like that, uh, probably would have never happened and you would have not seen your son again. One injustice after another. See, they should have been on the side and the Guatemalan uh, court of protection. You are an asylum seeker and you should have gotten asylum and the protection you deserve. Irina? Uh, Agrum, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Christopher Smith, I am very grateful to you for your support, for your courage. It's, it, it, my daughter me help me to translate смотри что 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 я была шокирована как большинством выступающих вообще была проигнорирована наша трагедия они как ни в чем не бывало поддерживали айфаны говорили and continued as if nothing happened. And this is exactly what is happening here in Guatemala as well. People simply ignore it and continue with their life as if nothing has happened. Я услышала много о том, что если кто-то что-то сказал, это значит на суде на сесик наговаривают. У меня под каждым моим словом есть long time. У меня все прописано. А я от них, кроме слов, Честная, yeah, хорошая, yeah. справедливая. Вообще ничего не слышала. My mother is saying that she heard a lot of words like hearsay or we can't sanction somebody because she said or he said. And my mother wants to say that we have evidence on the, each single word that we said. We have evidence for every single word, physical evidence. However, she can see that other witnesses who are saying that uh, or accusing us of hearsay they do not have evidence. Они so говорят, there are a lot of people who are saying смело. that oh, somebody is brave and somebody is a champion of justice, but there is no evidence of that. While we do have evidence and we have submitted it before the hearing, so it can be seen.
Да, и единственное человеческое участие, которое я здесь вижу, это только Кристофера Смита. And my mother is saying, uh, and I read, that the only human uh, response that we can see here is yours, Mr. Smith. And thank you very much for, thank you very for, much. for paying attention. Thank you very much. And I just would mention, I would ask you, Mr. Chairman, uh, that we include um, uh, statements from um, uh, Calderon, an attorney, Rafael Estrada, Steve Hecht, and Jared Gesser. Gesser get, uh, and, and I just would say uh, what I think will be the next speaker, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, was at our hearing, you might recall, Arena, uh, and was very eloquent in her defense of you uh, at that hearing as well. So uh, I thank you. And there are many friends here, Marco Rubio, for example, and I and many others, uh, Senator Wicker, who cared deeply about your family, and we're not going to give up on this. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I, I should also say for the record, um, you know, uh, we had uh, appealed on behalf of the Bikovas uh, early on, quite frankly, before anybody else on uh, on this committee uh, for mercy in this case. I examined this case very, very carefully. It's it's complicated. Nonetheless, um, I understand what you have all been through. I mean, we urge that you be allowed to seek asylum in a third country um, if that uh, if if that could somehow lessen your or ordeal. Uh, yes. But I should also say. Yes. I sh okay, I, I'm going to yield to you next, Sheila. <laughs> but the, but I should also I should also just remind everybody as we're having this discussion here today, uh, Sisig no longer exists in Guatemala, uh, and so um, uh, so. But what, in any event, um, Mr. Chairman, if you deal on that for one point, yes, we all know that. Yeah. But you know, past injustices you know, I, need to be I, held to account. And we must and, learn from it. Yeah, and I agree with, with with it. And I've examined this case very, very closely. You can make a request to the former head of Sisig if you want. I, 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 I regret, this is my opinion, that this case has been used as a way to go after uh, an organization that I think has um, actually done a great service. Now, we have a difference of opinion on that. And I don't believe the Sisig is the you know, the, is the mastermind behind all of, of what has just been said. But having said all that, uh, the Bekovas, we, you know, we certainly are, you know, are, are sympathetic uh, as to your situation. And that's why many of us early on, uh, you know, tried to see whether there was a way out of this for you. Uh, but if we want to get into the the specific charges and the, and the, and the complications of this case, that leads us to a longer discussion, um, and it and it just and I, I don't think we ought to go there. But anyway, Dr. Gonzalez, I, I just want to make sure that we because this is, when I finish here, I think we're done. But I want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to say what they want. I mean, listening to your testimony, basically, and I'm simplifying it, but you're basically saying that places like Guatemala, you know, are should be able to do their own thing, um, and basically. U.S. is interfering. Other countries are interfering. You know when they support these international institu uh, institutions designed at getting at issues like impunity. I mean, but basically, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's like we could do it without anybody. Am I understanding that correctly? Right. And uh, thank you very much. For, for yeah. And before you answer, let me, let me just say the question: If that's the case, then what the hell's been going on for the last several decades when the issue of let corruption? Me tell you. Let me tell you. control, but you go ahead. Let me tell you what has been going on. Okay. You have been listening to the wrong people. Okay. You, you have been supporting the false civil society. Uh, I am astonished to see the um, the false narratives that I have heard this morning here. It seems to me that uh, the real truth is. 180 degrees apart. The, unfortunately, the left has made a strong lobby for years in the US. And uh, we, the simple citizens, don't have any chance to be to be here. So this is an extraordinary uh, opportunity. I don't think that anybody has had this opportunity in Guatemala before me. Uh, I'm not uh, stating on the oath, but believe me, I'm yeah. telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yeah. And you can come and check the facts here. 
I will be glad to uh, wait on you here and take you to the facts. Yeah. I guess, I guess my response to that was that as somebody who's visited Guatemala on several occasions over the years um, and have seen human rights defenders murdered, church and faith-based leaders murdered, and there's been no justice, it's hard to believe that the judicial system and the court system and the justice system is working the way we anybody, no matter what you may think. And by the way, whether you're on the right or the left, as, as uh, Chairman Smith pointed out in the beginning, everybody should be entitled to justice, right? Um, everybody should be treated equally under the law. And so if you want to characterize everybody as being left-wing and somehow it justifies uh, their persecution, that can't be right either. Uh, and so I'm just, I, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your perspective. I, I'm just saying that, um, you know, and, and again, we're talking about Guatemala with you, but in general, um, there, there should, the, no matter what your politics may be, people should be concerned uh, about the backsliding of democracy and the, and just the undercutting of the judicial system. Um, and I think that's something we all ought to be concerned about. Ms. Bakova, um, I just want to say to you, I again, I, you know, when when your case was brought to me, brought to my attention early on from Bill Browder, I we did um, advocate on your behalf and. Um, and I, you know, and and um, and I just, and I guess where we diverge is that Sisig, which no longer exists in Guatemala, so it's kind of beside the point that somehow that that was the culprit here. Um, it was the, um, you know, it, it was the uh, uh, the public ministry that prosecuted your case, not not uh, Sisig. And then I, my colleague Norma Torres just re reminded me that. Uh, you know, under the Trump administration, the uh, acting principal deputy assistant secretary of state uh, for WHA stated, quote, our embassy and department have looked into these allegations of collusion and thus far have found no evidence that it has occurred. So that's the Trump administration. That's not the Biden administration. That's not the Obama administration. It's the Trump. Well, my friend, yield. Uh, my good friend, yield. Happy to yield. I thank you. You know, you, as you know, you had asked that question uh, about CSIG uh, to Bill Browder after my hearing, and you did. He did provide a very detailed answer, which I would ask be a part of our record. No, but you know, as he goes through his timeline, he points out that the again the Russian bank VTB complaint against Bitcoin is accepted by CSIG on November thirteenth, two thousand fourteen, and then just two months later, the court issues a warrant. Uh, and then there's all this verbiage coming out of the Russians about how they're working hand in glove with with CSIG uh, in going after the Bitcoin. So, uh, again, I would love to have a much more in-depth investigation. Oh, yeah. just hasn't happened um, because and, and let's invite Velasquez to come and testify. I, 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 I never quote the Trump administration, um, but um, uh, this is Bill Browder. Yeah, no, but but Browder's timeline. And I and again, I. And friends and respect Bill Browder is partial and incomplete. I would say. Um, I think it's partial. And, and uh, so Very I would. Thorough. But having said, no, I I'm not I'm not I'm not well, trying to. If I could, Mr. Chairman, I'm several not, of our witnesses talked about other people who had. I'm not trying to charges diminish, against them, and to, without anywhere near the the. Right. the yeah, I just want to. I just want to. Documentation. I just want to make sure that we are directing our concerns at the culprits here. Um, and, uh, oh, and 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 that we're and that we're focused on that. But anyway, Chairman, the co yes, Ms. Torres. I, I apologize. You know, there 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 is a huge piece um, of the Guatemalan community missing in this conversation. You know, we spent you know close to an hour talking about the unfortunate incident you know that happened uh, to this Russian family. I am sorry to be the one to rain on your parade. Um, and, you know, I, I, I thank you, everyone, for caring about one Russian family. What is wrong with 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 what this this hearing where, where you have gone totally, you know, the other way and forgotten, you know, what human rights and, and what we're fighting for? Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you for trying to bring us back to the reality, you know, of, of what has happened to um, you know, to the invisible people, you know, that look like me and Representative, Representative Sheila Jackson in the region, they have never heard, never. 
And I appreciate your voice. I appreciate uh, Ms. Torres' voice and Co-Chair Smith's voice, who I know cares deeply about human rights issues. And, um, and you know, on, on, on most issues, we're all kind of in sync. Um, but going back to what Ms. Torres said, I mean, a genocide occurred in Guatemala, and there was never any justice. Um, and I think there's 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 this view uh, that, um, you know, there needs to be more accountability, obviously more transparency, um, and more justice. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've lost, I, I've, I've many people, I, many friends that I have known in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, you know, have all been persecuted and there's no justice. And when I hear governments talk to me about the rule of law, and the rule of law is whatever they, whatever whoever's in power wants it to be, that's where the problem is, right? So, Ms. Bekova, I apologize, though, but I mean, briefly, if there's any last words you want to say to us, we would certainly welcome that. And we're grateful that you're at this hearing. You have to unmute. You have to unmute. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I believe that the question here should be not just how to only protect judges and prosecutors, but how can victims on their corruption be protected as well? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Clo before I close, let me ask my good friend, Mr. Smith, whether there's anything he wants to add for the record before we wrap this up. Uh, no, thank you very much. I think it was a very good hearing. Uh, I do thank you for your empathy, especially for Irina and her family. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I'm a great believer, and this is why, whether it be Natan Taransky, the great Jewish refusenik, uh, or, or Nelson Mandela, or any other uh, person who has suffered, they are often a tip of the iceberg. So if there's corruption against the Bitkoffs, uh, there is very likely corruption at a whole other lot of levels. And I've always been worried about accountability, especially for those. I mean, I asked Gutierrez, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, about the Bitcoffs in a one on one meeting with him. And he said he has no accountability. First, he didn't know much about the case, and I could understand that, or, or CSIG itself. Uh, but then he did say, and we did follow up with him, uh, that where is the accountability? Who actually oversees the people who are, uh, to make sure that absolutely is, every, everything is fair uh, and there's no, no uh, pr you know, the prosecutorial discretion has no other agenda. It's just, you go after the bad guys and the bad uh, players. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Let, let me just close with this. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I feel strongly about this issue, uh, I did a lot of human rights work in El Salvador when I was a young congressional aide in 1981. Uh, we actually in 1989 we investigated the murders of the six Jesuit priests, her housekeeper and her daughter who were murdered at the University of Central America. There was no justice in that case. Uh, in 1981, in a village called El Mazote, over a thousand people were murdered, were massacred. You know, um, the official uh, stance of the U.S. government during the 1980s was it never happened. When the war was over, a forensic team went in there and dug it into, found a shallow grave and identified all these remains. Most of the people that were killed were women, but were children, were also children. And in, I visited El Mazote. I, I took my daughter with me there, and um, and as she was reading the, the the list of victims, they would have a name, and they have an age, and there were a lot of names with zero after the uh, after the names because these were infants so young that they had no idea really how old they were. And that was in 1981. Um, and in El Salvador today, there's an attempt to try to get some justice in that case. And the powers that be, notwithstanding the fact that they all have told us to our face they want justice, are doing everything they can to make sure there's no justice on a massacre that happened in 1981. You know, if, if we can't get a, a system, a, ju a judiciary system, to work, on a case like that, where there's all this international attention, and then how the hell are we going to get it to work? You know, when you know some, you know, lesser-known human rights defender or some business person or what, whoever, right, who is not so prominent, um, is wronged. It just it won't it doesn't work. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I, I mean, we, 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 
you know, we we need a an independent uh, uh, judiciary. Every you know, in this country, we need and, and and the people of El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua deserve it, and their countries as well. And I think some of the recommendations here uh, about what we can do, maybe some regional approaches, uh, using some of the international organizations that have some juice as well. But th- these are this is important, um, and I to to those you know um, in other countries who are listening, I hope that you you know that that we take this very seriously. So I thank you all for being here. And with, and with that, this ends the, uh, the hearing and everybody be safe.